Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Mariam Abdullah, Professor in Orthodontics at the University of Jordan and the Senior Orthodontic Consultant at the Jordan University Hospital. Today's lecture is going to be about development of normal occlusion. We're going to cover this topic in two lectures. Our reference mainly is going to be Chapter 4 from the Handbook of Orthodontics, CBs and Coburn, second edition. And we're not going to be really concerned with the prenatal development. It's mainly starting from postnatal development. Um, and of course, in addition to this lecture, the uh, handout from, uh, uh, from the slides. Our lecture outlines is going to include what's occlusion and then the different stages of occlusal development, starting from uh, late fetal development and birth, and then edentulous stage, eruption of primary teeth, primary stage, eruption of permanent teeth, and that's the mixed dentition, and then the permanent stage. We will also talk about dimensional changes in the dental arches, third molders and their eruption, crowding and late lower incisor crowding and under six keys to normal occlusion. Um, uh, some of these topics you already covered, but we're just going to review it quickly. So as we said, occlusion is a topic that you already covered in a, in a whole course, and it's mainly the relationship between the maxillary and the mandibular teeth in occlusion and during all uh, types of functions, uh, during swallowing, breathing, uh, mastication, and in, it includes all the tissues and structures that are related to this function. We also said that uh, uh, about 35% of the population will have uh, normal occlusion. Uh, very, very rarely they will have ideal occlusion. And uh, a normal occlusion is a patient with a little bit of deviation from the ideal occlusion that will not affect aesthetic or function. And uh, to know what's a normal occlusion, we already explained about six keys to normal uh, occlusion by Andrews. Otherwise, if this deviation from the ideal will affect aesthetic or function, then we call this malocclusion, and this represents about 65% of the population. This lecture, we will focus on normal occlusion. You need to know how to, does the normal occlusion develop at different stages of dental development. How do we reach to this permanent dentition with be this beautiful occlusion? That 65% of the population will have malocclusion and the etiology of malocclusion will be covered in multiple lectures related to skeletal factors, soft tissue factors, dental factors, pathology, habits, etc, etc. But for this lecture we're going to be focusing on the development of normal occlusion. And it's important to know, as we always say, what's normal to be able to uh, identify what's the abnormal. So, for example, if you look at this patient's picture, this patient is in the mixed dentition. You need to know that this spacing between the incisors is considered a normal physiological development. You should not identify this as a feature of malocclusion. This is considered a normal physiological development. And at different stages of the occlusion, we will have different features that are considered normal. Now, if we talk about tooth development at early stages, we have different stages. And if anything goes wrong at different at, at one of these different stages, then we will have some dental abnormality that will occur. At the initiation and proliferation stages, anything goes wrong can lead to hypodontia, a complete absence of the tooth tooth agenesis, or the opposite, we can have an extra tooth, supernumerary. At the histodifferentiation stages of tooth development, anything goes wrong can lead to amelogenesis imperfecta or dentinogenesis imperfecta. Morphodifferentiation stage, anything goes wrong can lead to uh, a certain uh, shape abnormality, like the torodontism, a conical crown, or pick-shaped, uh, usually lateral. At that stage of acquisition, any abnormalities can lead to macrodontia, big teeth, or the opposite, microdontia, small teeth in general. Uh, at the calcification stage, anything can go wrong can lead to hypo hypoplasia. And at the eruption stage, we might end up with impaction or neonatal tooth. Now, 
the stages of occlusal development start at, uh, of course, before we have the both before birth, birth, and then after birth. Now, late fetal development and birth, we will talk about it and, and what's relevant to us in terms of dental development. From birth, we will have no teeth all the way until the start of eruption of the primary teeth. And this is around six months, a stage of six months uh, period. Uh, and we call it the edential stage in babies. Now, when we have the start of eruption of primary teeth around six months of age, all the way to two and a half to three years of age, we will have the stage of eruption of primary teeth. And then from two and a half to three years of age until the six years of age, we will have no more eruption of any other teeth. And this is a fully functioning primary dentition. Now, at the six years of age on average, all the way to 13 years of age, we will have the start of eruption of permanent teeth and we call this stage the mixed dentition. After this stage, after we lose the last uh, the deciduous tooth, then we will end up with a fully functioning secondary dentition or the permanent dentition. So these are the different stages of den dental development. Uh, during the late fetal development, uh, we will have the development of all primary teeth starting well before birth, of course. When we say dental development, this is not calcification. This is the, the start of development of uh, the, the stages that we talked about before the calcification. And here applies the rules of sexes. So at six weeks intrauterine, we will have the start of dental development. Um, at this stage, you will, of course, uh, if you take a radiograph, you will see nothing. There is no calcification whatsoever. By sixth month intrauterine, the calcification of all primary teeth had already begun. They actually start around four months of uh, uh, intrauterine, but by the sixth month, all primary teeth should have started calcification. Six months of age, so after birth, at six months of age, we will have the start of eruption of the first primary tooth. At six years of age, there will be the end of the primary dentition as the permanent, uh, the first permanent tooth starts to erupt. So this is to show you the uh, the dates, uh, the the important numbers for calcification and eruption, and it can be presented as a table or as a diagram. This table is from Laura Mitchell, uh, Introduction to Orthodontics, and as you can see, the calcification of uh, all uh, primary teeth uh, as they start at fourth month intrauterine, they actually by the sixth month. Uh, enter it run, all primary teeth should have started calcification, crown calcification. And uh, these numbers used in, in the diagram, the one inside the diamond shape, represent the mean. And then the rest of the rectangular shape represent the standard deviation, two standard deviations. So as you can see, there is lots of variation between individuals, but yet you need to know the mean. You need to memorize the average for the uh, uh, for the eruption mainly, but not for the calcification. Calcification, just in general, we need to know that from fourth month to six months, we have the process of calcification for the primary teeth, of course. Now, at birth, birth is considered a traumatic process. So, at birth, we will have a special disturbance in the calcification of the deciduous teeth. And this will lead to a line. We call it the neonatal line. Almost every child has this line to represent the normal traumatic process of birth. And as you can see, this is the birth stage. And this is when the, what the calcification stage for each tooth and where the neonatal line is expected to occur. So it's more gingivally for the incisors because they are at the, at the later stage of calcification and it's more uh, occlusally for the molars because they are at, a, uh, the birth happens at an, an earlier stages of calcification. Now, similarly, if anything uh, can disturb 
the growth of the child early on, and this disturbance lasts one to two weeks, then we will have a visible record uh, within the classification of the teeth. Okay, for example, illness, fever, um, starvation, malnutrition, a uh, certain uh, uh, disease that causes uh, growth disturbance. If this lasts one to two weeks, it will cause visible record. Okay, but normally, normally, almost every child will have a neonatal line related to the normal birth uh, traumatic process. So this is the red line represent where the neonatal a line or ring should be presented on uh, the uh, deciduous teeth. So this is for the maxillary teeth and this is for the mandibular teeth. Now, as we said at birth, we will have, normally we will have no teeth, but the maxillary and the mandibular gum pads are usually covered with dense fibrous uh, periosteum. And usually they are divided into segmented elevations that are related to the future areas of eruption of teeth. Usually the upper gum is horseshoe in shape. You can see it's horseshoe in shape and the anterior part of it is rounded. And it is positioned more anteriorly than the mandibular gum uh, pad. And it is longer than the mandibular gum pad. The lower one, the mandibular one, is U-shaped and the anterior part is more flattened. And uh, we have prominent grooves distal to the primary canine in the maxilla and the mandible. So this, this, these are the lateral sulci. They are positioned distal to the primary canine. As we said, the maxilla is positioned anterior to the mandible, so we have positive overjet. They don't meet in the anterior part, the maxilla and the mandible, they don't come in contact, so we have anterior open bite and this is considered normal. But the only contact is usually at the posterior gum pad, at the posterior part of it. The gum pad relationship at this early stage cannot predict the future jaw relationship. So we cannot say this patient has class three or class one or class two skeletal pattern, for example. Uh, because the relationship between the gum pads at that at this early stage does not predict the future jaw relationship. As we said, uh, the uh, gum pads anteriorly do not meet. We have anterior open bite, and this is important for the tongue to come forward to meet the lower lip to facilitate suckling and feeding for the baby. So this is to show you at birth what teeth are calcified. So the gray area here, the gray uh, colored teeth are those that are calcified. So this is the A, B, C, D, E. At birth, we will have also the first permanent molar uh, should have calci uh, should start a calci uh, calcification. Uh, the calcification of the first permanent molar is usually around birth. Now the red area here represents the developing follicle not calcified, just developing follicle of the future permanent teeth. So this is the central, lateral, canine, uh, first premolar, second premolar, okay? But the, calci the only calcified tooth at first is gonna be the first permanent molar. So the primary dentition stage, as we said, extends from the time of eruption of the primary teeth, which is usually at six month, month of age, until the eruption of the first permanent tooth, which usually extends uh, at the age of six years of age. Okay, the, uh, the classification, as we said, for the primary teeth begins between the fourth month to sixth month, prenatal months, intrauterine. The mandibular primary teeth usually begins classification before the maxillary primary teeth. So these are general rules. The central incisors usually calcify first, and the second primary molars uh, will calcify last. And after eruption, the root will take about one to one and a half years to, to complete its calcification. Sometimes at birth, we will have a tooth erupting, showing. This is called a natal tooth, uh, or this might happen at the first month of life, and this is called neonatal tooth, or the second or the third month of life, and this is called pre-erupted teeth. All these, all these terminologies will usually describe uh, a tooth that has erupted early. 
Luckily, most of the time, this is a normal deciduous incisor, okay? Rarely, this might be a supernumerary, as long as it's not uh, too mobile to cause uh, risk of inhalation, or if it's uh, not causing, as long as it's not causing feeding uh, disturbances, uh, then basically it should be left in, in, in place. Otherwise, it could be extracted to facilitate feeding or, as we said, to, if, the, if there is risk of inhalation, there is a, a large mobility. Okay, so this is considered normal variation of uh, eruption, uh, timing of eruption. Now, the, ex the exact dates of eruption are variable. So up to six months of delay or acceleration is considered normal. So we say six months, the lower central incisor should erupt plus minus six because we have standard deviation. So a little bit of acceleration or delay is considered normal, but the actual sequence of eruption is very important to be preserved. Okay, so the first two to erupt is the mandibular central incisors. And uh, usually this is followed by the rest of the incisors. Three to four months later, we will have the mandibular and maxillary first molars, the D. And after that, three to four months after that, we will have the maxillary and the mandibular canines. And then the primary dentition is usually completed around 24 months to 30 months of age, where the maxillary and the mandibular second molars erupt. Okay, so the sequence of eruption is A, B, D, and then C, E. Okay, so usually the uh, first molar comes ahead uh, of the canine, before the canine. And this is a considered normal sequence of eruption, normal sequence of eruption. So between six months all the way to 24 or 30 months, this is the stage of developing and eruption. Sorry, this is the stage of eruption of the primary teeth, primary teeth. After the last primary tooth erupt, which is the E, then we have the stage of fully functioning primary dentition, fully functioning primary dentition. Between three years of age until six years of age, until the first permanent tooth erupts, there will be no changes in terms of eruption and loss of teeth. There should, these teeth should, fully function, should, fully, should be fully functioning during this uh, three years period to maintain normal uh, development for the rest of the permanent teeth. Any early extraction or loss will disturb the normal development. Now, at the complete primary dentition, we will have semicircular shaped arches. The primary incisors are, compared to the permanent incisors, are usually smaller, whiter, and more upright than their successors. The incisors should have positive overjet and positive overbite. Okay, for example, an anterior open bite is not considered normal. And a very increased overjet of more than four millimeters is not considered normal. So this this is just to show you the difference between the primary teeth and the permanent incisor. You can see the permanent incisors; they are more yellowish, more bulky uh, compared to the deciduous incisors. Again, just to show you that these are the permanent uh, teeth and the permanent first permanent molar compared to the deciduous CDE. You can see that the CDE are uh, whiter and uh, relatively uh, smaller in size. Okay, right. Um, another important normal. Uh, criteria that could be seen in the primary dentition is, of course, primate or anthropoid spaces in addition to generalized spaces. So if you look at the primary dentition and you see that there is lack of space, this is not normal. What's normal is to have spaced arches. Okay. Another feature that is considered normal is to have the primary first uh, molars uh, and the canines the first, the primary first molars and the canines should be in class one relationship. But the E, the primary second molar, should have a flush terminal relationship. The distal edges of the E should have a flush terminal relationship. So we will talk about these criteria in specific. At the early fully functioning 
primary dentition, usually the overbite is deep. As the primary dentition is functioning during the three years period, we will have attrition and we might end up with reduced overbite all the way to edge to edge relationship, what we call it edge to edge or zero overbite relationship. So the overbite, just to remind you, is the vertical relationship between the upper and the lower incisors. Normally, the upper incisor should cover one third of the lower incisors. In the primary dentition, as we said, a deep bite uh, all the way to edge to edge relationship is considered normal variation in the vertical relationship. Uh, but an anterior open bite is not considered normal. It's not considered normal at this stage. Uh, again, the overjet, just to remind you, is the, very, is the horizontal relationship between the uh, upper and the lower incisors. Two to four millimeter of overjet in the permanent dentition is considered normal. In the primary dentition, zero to four millimeters is considered normal. Okay, so a reverse overjet in the primary dentition is not considered normal. Now, the transition from the primary dentition stage to the permanent dentition stage has an impact on the dental arch length, circumference, and the inter intermolar and the intercanine width. So if we look here, the jaw, uh, the upper and the lower jaw grow considerably in size after birth all the way to six months of age. After that, very little increase in dimensions in the tooth bearing regions takes place. During the eruption of the permanent dentition, we will have some transverse changes. For example, in the intercanine width, we will have increase of two millimeters in the mandible of the intercanine width and four millimeters in the maxilla only. And after eruption of the permanent incisors, these changes will be minimal. Uh, the same for the intermolar width. Again, we will have increase of two millimeters in the mandible and around four millimeters in the maxilla. Uh, but the afterwards, after about 12 years of age, there will be minimal changes. Most of the changes will be in the length of the arches to accommodate eruption of molars. The sixth and the seven and the eight. Okay, but in the anterior area where we have premolars and incisors, uh, there will be minimal changes in the circumference of the arches. So let's go back to the spaces. What we said is that it's normal to have spaced arches. These spaces are called generalized spacing or developmental spacing, okay? And it occurs in almost two thirds of the population in the primary dentition. We also have localized spacing and we call these primate spaces. Primate or anthropoid spaces usually occurs in about 87% in the maxilla, in the maxillary arch, uh, and usually it is uh, mesial to the canines. In the mandibular arch, 78% uh, will have spacing, and usually it is uh, distal to the canine. It is distal to the canine. Um, why not 100% of the population? Because as we said, 35% will have normal occlusion, and 65% will have malocclusion. Okay, so it's, it's normal. Uh, that uh, some individuals will have primate spaces and some will not have primate spaces. So just to show you, uh, in the upper, the primate spaces are mesial to the canine, and in the lower, it's distal to the canine. These are called primate spaces or anthropoid spaces. Now, these spaces are extremely important to accommodate the permanent teeth that are mesodistally wider. So if we look only on the primary incisors, then if the primary incisors are crowded, then there is 100% chance that the secondary incisors, the, part, the permanent incisors will be crowded. If they are aligned with no spaces, if they are well aligned, there is no spacing between the primary incisors, then there is two in three chance of crowding. If there is less than three millimeter spacing, there is very mild spacing, then there is one in two chance of crowding, 50-50%. We will need six millimeter spacing at least to say that this patient will have little chance of crowding. So again, to have spacing between the primary incisors and the primary dentition should be the normal, should be considered normal. So again, if you look at 
A and B that represent a patient in the uh, primary dentition with spacing of about six millimeters in the upper and again in the lower. We can see the spacing. This is beautiful. And this will indicate that this patient in the future will have little chance of crowding. On the other hand, this patient has a well-aligned lower arch, a mildly crowded upper arch. So this patient has two to three, two to three, two in three chance of having crowding. And this is large, if not even more. Okay. So if you have any concerned parents that come to your clinic saying that the teeth are too small and the there are lots of spacing, we would we we need just to reassure the parents that this is considered normal physiological stage of development. Now, going back to what we said regarding the uh, buccal segment relationship in the prime in the primary dentition, we said that the canine and the first molar should have class one. But the second molar, we're looking at the distal planes and they should be flush terminals. Why are we concerned with the distal planes? Well, because the distal margins of the second primary molar will guide the eruption of the first permanent molars and it should guide them normally to class one. So to start off with, they should be flush terminal. What are the other variations? Well, the other variations is a mesial step where the lower E is more mesially positioned than the upper E or a distal step where the lower E is more distally positioned compared to the upper E. So these are the th three variations for the deciduous uh, dentition buccal segment relationship uh, concerning the E, flush terminal, mesial step, and distal step. And the flush terminal is considered the normal. Okay. When we talk about the permanent dentition, we will show you how this flush terminal will guide and help the first permanent molars to erupt into class one molar relationship. Now we will come to the eruption of the permanent teeth. Eruption of the permanent teeth as the start of eruption of the permanent teeth, uh, and usually it is the, usually the first permanent tooth to erupt is usually the lower uh, central incisor. Then this is the end of the fully functioning primary dentition and the start of the mixed dentition stage. Usually this stage, the mixed dentition stage, is completed at the time where the last primary tooth is lost, is shedded. Okay. Um, now again, eruption sequence is more important than the exact timing, timing of eruption for the permanent teeth, the same as the deciduous teeth. You need to know the sequence. You need to know the time on average, but, but the sequence is more important. So the first permanent molars, in terms of calcification, are the first permanent tooth to calcify. They usually calcify around birth, around birth. The mandible and the maxilla, they will start to calcify around birth. The rest of the teeth will calcify three to four months after birth in terms of incisors, uh, four to five months after birth in terms of the canines, and then after that, the rest of the teeth. What's really important to note is that the maxillary lateral incisors will calcify much later compared with the rest of the incisors, even compared to the canine. So the maxillary permanent lateral incisor will calcify 10 to 12 months after birth. And this is a bit late. And this is very much related to the increased risk of dental anomalies related to the maxillary lateral incisors because we have a, uh, more chance to be exposed to abnormalities uh, in relation to the developmental stages. So uh, the calcification of the uh, first premolars and second premolars will go from 21 months, 24 months, uh, all the way to 30 months. Uh, the same for the maxilla and the mandible. And uh, for the second molars, it's like 30 to 36 months after birth uh, for the maxillary uh, one. And then for the mandibular one, 26, 7 to 30 months uh, of age, uh, start of calcification. 
Now, in terms of eruption, as you can see, the time of eruption is important. And the last tooth uh, to erupt in the mandibular arch, and here we're talking only about teeth that has a predecessor, that has a deciduous tooth to resorb. The last tooth to erupt in the mandible is the second uh, premolar, but in the maxillary teeth, the last tooth to erupt that has a predecessor is the maxillary canine. Uh, so these are important things to note regarding this table. With regards to eruption of the permanent teeth, uh, there are two stages of eruption. The pre-emergence eruption, okay, the stage of eruption before I can see the tooth inside the oral cavity, and the post-emergent eruption. Now, with regard to the post-emergent eruption, there are four important stages. Both emergent spurt, when we say spurt, that means something that's happening quickly, acceleration of the event. And then we have the juvenile occlusal equilibrium, something that is going really slowly. And then the third stage of pupertal spurt in, in eruption, another acceleration stage. And finally, adult occlusal equilibrium, another slow process of eruption. Now, the pre emergent eruption. We need to have two important um, mechanisms going normally to be able to have a proper eruption. The first one is to have resorption of both bone and roots of the predecessor to have a normal eruption of the permanent tooth. The second is to have a normal eruption mechanism. The mechanism itself should be normal. Sometimes we have normal resorption of bone and roots, and then the tooth fails to erupt because the eruption mechanism is abnormal. And this is what we call primary failure of eruption. Primary failure of eruption. Okay, so the two mechanisms that should go uh, normally to have a normally erupting permanent tooth is resorption of bone and the root of the primary tooth, the primary success, the predecessor. And secondly, is to have a normal eruption mechanism. Now, post-emergent eruption will start with a relatively rapid eruption from the time a tooth first penetrates the gingiva until it reaches the occlusion, until it comes in function. And we call this post-emergent spurt. Once it comes in occlusion, it is functioning, then we will have a phase that is called juvenile occlusal equilibrium, where we have very slow eruption. The juvenile occlusal equilibrium, this eruption should be equal to the vertical growth and development of the craniofacial structures. Okay, you cannot see a gap because both processes will go parallel. We will have craniofacial growth and development. At the same time, we will have juvenile occlusal equilibrium to compensate for this vertical changes and growth. After that, we will have pupertal spurt and eruption, where we have pupertal spurt and jaw growth. If you remember, at the, at the pupertal spurt growth stage, we will have an accelerated growth of the craniofacial structures. So we will we need to have a parallel mechanism of eruption to accommodate the, these vertical changes. We call this pupertal spurt in eruption. When this pubertal growth spurt finishes and ends, then we will have a final phase in tooth eruption called adult occlusal equilibrium. And this will continue during all uh, along the adult life. And we will have a very, very slow eruption to compensate for, for example, uh, attrition in patients who have bruxism and loss of tooth structure. And it will also appear if you have, uh, if, you, if the an antagonist is lost. So for example, if you have an extracted six in the upper arch, then the lower six usually erupts uh, into a vertical, into a more uh, extruded position. And this really confirms that the eruption process will continue all through life. So this is the pre-emergent eruption stage and the post-emergent eruption stages that includes the post-emergent uh, spurt, juvenile occlusal equilibrium, pubertal spurt in eruption, and then adult occlusal equilibrium. Now we will come to the general rules that um, applies to the eruption of the permanent teeth. Usually females uh, will have eruption of teeth before males, 
be, uh, and usually this is uh, on average about four or five months, five months. Uh, the mandibular teeth usually erupts before the maxillary teeth and um, uh, the uh, eruption of the permanent teeth uh, starts when the crown calcification is completed and the eruption, the pre-emergent eruption will take about two to five years to, to reach the alveolar crest. And after eruption, it will take about one to two years to reach the occlusion. Okay, so the pre-emergent eruption takes about two to five years after crown uh, calcification is completed. And then the post-emergent uh, eruption, that is the first uh, juvenile, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the post-emergent, the post-eruption acceleration period uh, will take about one to two years. Teeth usually emerge when three-fourths of their root are completed. And after eruption, the root of the permanent teeth will take about two to three years to fully calcify. So these are the general rules that applies to the uh, eruption of the permanent teeth. Now, next lecture, we're going to continue talking about the uh, sequence of eruption of the permanent teeth and the rest of the headings that we talked about. Thank you for listening.